Um, I'm Hayden and I'm a bridge to building surveyor based in Wellington. Um, thank you for being here today. I feel, always feel a bit, a bit odd talking in front of so really talented, skilled designers like yourself, so you just have to bear with me because I'm just a humble building surveyor. Um, so my talk today is really based about essentially my experiences living and working in the Wellington region. Um, I'm aware that your experiences here will be a little bit different because you took Geographically, you're different, but you're very varied from the flat plains to the hills of, of, of around the um, peninsulas, etc. So everything's going to be a bit different. You've had the earthquake, which has changed the landscape, but, but some of this will have a lot of relevance. And it's not just related to leaky buildings, it's, it's, but all buildings leak, and they leak over a long period of time. And it doesn't matter whether they're a, a modern leaky building or a good old fashioned old villa, they usually all leak and they just that they've been there longer. So what I talk about today is actually covers a broad range of, of issues. And as you'll see, it's not just about leaky buildings, it's also about you keeping yourself safe as well. Um, just want to show that's that's a what's relevant about that particular site. A, it's a hell of a mess. Um, hope you don't go to sites that are that messy. It got worse because they had two dogs, or the builder bought two dogs on site every day, and it was like a minefield. So you, it's just like keep your site clean if you can. It makes it much safer and tidier. And just something that's of interest um, in that building, that's a 1980s building. It's not what you'd call a leaky building, but it's a 1980s weatherboard building, and it's substantially damaged. And it's not something that we find is a big surprise at all, but it might be a surprise to people that look at that building before it got pulled the cladding off and go, oh, that looks fine, it's 1980s of weatherboard. And actually, a lot of weatherboard buildings still fail in the same way as others do, but they just take longer if they aren't detailed properly. And because you're designers, you'll appreciate design detail is really critical to how buildings work or don't work. Um, I just, there's different colours in the, in the screen. That's the more accurate for the, for the reds, so if you're looking at red colours, that's more how it should be. That one's a bit washed out, but I see the, the whites come up, so just flick between. Um, just as a point is there, you'll see, and it's a really classic leaky building area, really, you'll see that I've marked up red paint on the damaged framing where it needs to be replaced. And that's a really good indication of the common points where, where you'll find leak points and resulting damage. So you've got the corners, both corners, and you've got below the heads of the, the, the head flashings below the windows where the water's come down, down through the building. So you said, are all the common points that you'll find on almost any building, that's where they're going to be leaking. Got a perfectly good wall, open up a hole, that's where it'll start leaking. And at the corners where you have corner boards and poor detail. And you can probably read, that's just, you know, that pitched roof, pretty typical sort of a, a house. So, well, just have a, have a look. So, but there's a lot more to timber remediation and actually about the whole picture, really. And so timber remediation is part of the picture, but as professionals involved in the building industry, you need to make sure that you have good outcomes, quality and co-compliant outcomes in what you do. And part of the reason for that, as you'll see, uh, your important part to play, and I've, if you delete the, the red L, it, it, it revert, reverts to the word pay because if you don't get it right, somebody's likely to come knocking on your door and want you to pay for the remedial cost and the damage, and you're being dragged into some horrible dispute between lots of parties. So it's about keeping yourself financially safe. Um, and because what I do as a building surveyor is I look at lots of fail, failures and lots of building failures and report on them and go through the court process and drag people, help with lawyers. It, it, it just gets horrible. And sometimes lawyers. Um, Architects get involved in that process as well, depending on how much involvement they've had. So it's really good right at the start to try and manage what you do so that you do it properly. And it's about good detail. Good detail will give you good durability. And, it, it, and it's a big picture. So it's not just about the timber remediation. It's a bit more than that. So it, it, it's the focus from everything you do is about doing it properly. Okay, so one of the things that interesting with a little bit of discussion in the paper the last day or two about, and it's been banging on about it for a long time, durability. We, in New Zealand, focus on durability, often thinking about the code, be E2, 
B2, the B2 15 year period. Our attitude to how we build buildings, it's not so much the issue with the code, it's the, the fact that we tend to rely on that as the benchmark. We need to think much bigger. And that's a great, classic example of a building, and it's a, perhaps an extreme example, but you can go all around the world and you'll see buildings that last for generations upon generations upon generations. And when you're overseas, you'll, you'll hear someone having a debate about durability, and I took them five, 10, 15 years, and you go, it, it just doesn't make any sense. So what I'm trying to say is try and build durability into your buildings so that you don't have the timber remediation issues later on. That, by the way, is, um, is in Cappadocia in Turkey. And what really cracks me up about those buildings, and they've been there thousands of years, is you'll see a little satellite dish between the two structures there. And so, you know, life just goes on, and it's just, it's just, it's just another house for these people. But it's, um, and even the buildings behind, you can see they're of a far more durable <coughs> nature than most of our buildings are. Uh, obviously, they use materials that were available to them. So that's, um, that's what goes on there. Okay, so really what I'm just indicating is that the B2 minimums aren't, aren't the target. Think bigger, uh, think 25, 30 years, not 15 years, and I try and bang on to some government departments about that. Think about the big picture, the big projects that you do. They need to last for a long period for everybody, um, not just, so we need to use quality materials. Educate your clients to expect more than the lowest possible price and the outcome because they don't know. They just expect these things are going to last because everybody says that they will and that's just what it is. But actually you need to educate them because it's not their business. They, they just expect that these things will last. And unfortunately they tend not to. Um, I would have totally advise you to move away from fibre cement cladding systems. Um, I hate it when architects, architects tell me, oh, but it's on a cavity, it's going to work, it's all good, eh? And I go, mm, no. No, it's not, and that's one of the reasons is that fibre cement's moisture absorbent, and if you don't keep the water out of fibre cement, then it d does lots of horrible things. It changes and it sucks moisture up, and it, it moves in the sun, and it, 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 it starts to tear. And actually, most fibre cement products you might be aware is actually just wood, reconstituted wood with paper and glue, and it's all there. Well, once wet gets fungi gets in, it decays at the same as it does for wood. It doesn't. It, it's, 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 it's essentially the same thing, and you get the decay fungi in there, and it weakens the fibres, I mean it spits and it cracks and it leaks, leaks again and just because it's on a cavity it doesn't actually mean that it's going to, well A, your cladding is failing on the outside for a start and that's expensive and it doesn't necessarily mean that the water's not getting into your framing. Um, you've still got clip battens and it transfers across battens and it does things that it shouldn't do. So just be aware of your choice of materials. Um, consider the treatment levels of timber framing uh, and well actually timber cladding more likely. Um, you will, do you know what the difference between 3.2 and 3.1 is essentially? Well it's about the difference between Wellington to Auckland. It's a, it's a huge difference uh, and I'm talking in terms of durability. It, it, most builders think unfortunately that H3 like it used to be, H3 is H3 and it's good durable timber but actually no H3.1 is more like H1.2 and 3.2 is something way different and the 3.2 has got the chromium, the arsenic and the boron in it which, um, which cr chromium, the arsenic, and um, c copper, sorry. The chromium keeps the other, the, the other products in there, holds it in there, makes it really durable. So that timber can get quite wet for a long time and, and before it starts rotting. And when it does rot, it only is very slow and it just, just works away slowly. The H3.1 is the LOSP, the organic solvent, and it sort of vaporises and dissipates off. And if you don't keep the water out of it, and I'm talking weatherboards, if you don't prime the ends of the weatherboard and make sure it's well sealed in corners and the builders get onto it and do it properly, the water gets in and it rots it out. And so within 10, 15 years, you have quite significant rot within that weatherboard occurring. And most people don't know. Builders don't know because it's just H3, right? Well, uh, it's not. It's it's. It's what poles apart. I don't know why we, we produce it. I presume it's cheaper and it's environmentally friendlier, maybe. But you need to know that when you're building a building and if you have to spend a few more dollars and you can get H3.2 weatherboards, then maybe that's what you need to look at. Specify stainless fixings. You know, why just put galvanised fixings in when for the few extra dollars you can put the stainless ones in and you know it's going to work. It's going to be way more durable. So we are changing... It's about changing how we do these things and getting away from this. She'll be right, mate. You know, this po we don't have to be pioneers anymore. We can build stuff that works. And actually down here, you've, still <coughs> you've got stone and you've got examples of really good durable buildings. So it's, um, 
well, you don't move around much, you know. Okay, issues to consider. Um, just in common, it just, these are just things that I see. Um, so when an architect goes to site and they look at a, a building, the client says, I want to do some work. Generally, the building hasn't really been surveyed properly and the focus is on the particular part that needs to be worked on. Um, and it might even be around a weather tightness. You need to have good advice. You need to understand how the building's working and so that is this part the person said, I've got a bit of an issue in the window, is that actually happening everywhere, but they just haven't seen it. Because if you've got a, a common failure in a window system, chances are it's repeated everywhere. If you've got other cutting issues, it's probably repeated everywhere to more or less degrees. So you really want to understand what you're getting into before you get into it. It helps a lot because people appreciate it. Um, even if they don't like the news. So if you don't understand the extent of the issue or why the issue is occurring, then you've just got a very good chance of not getting the design solution right. So it's important just, just to get that right. Um, history shows us that poor outcomes, unhappy clients, unacceptable legal risk. And that's the history, of course, of Canada, Vancouver. When we went to, went to Vancouver in 2005 with lots of um, building surveyors, or a few of us, the Canadians had the leaky building problem early, way before we did. Um, well, that we knew we had it. And they, they went ahead and did all the remedial work, but they got it wrong badly because they didn't understand the failure mechanism. So they didn't understand why it failed. They didn't understand what they had to do to actually get it right. They just repeated the old mistakes. So they had to do it a second time. And we went up several 23-storey condominiums that were being reclad for the second time. And it's like each 18 months, of each job, you know, it's a long time. Just, um, it's, so all that stuff you need to try and avoid. Um, so in terms of timber remediation, um, quality assurance is becoming a big issue, particularly with, well, in our, my region and probably lots of other regions. And I'm aware every council is probably a bit different. They probably some aren't so onto it. And um, it's a matter of, and builders definitely often aren't onto it, but they are when we're finished and they're really good to deal with it after we've dealt, done one remedial job with them. Um, so it's about getting the standards right and you'll see a bit further on why Council now are requiring often timber remediation specialists to be involved partway through a project if they think there's a problem with planning and they're not satisfied that the builder is actually dealing with it properly. Remembering you have lots of different types of framing, you have old remu framing, and people say remu framing it's really good, durable. Well, it's not durable, it's just lasts longer. It, it, it lasts longer, but it's like I was in the house today, it was just a little, it just, just falling to bits, mainly insect damage, but badly, badly damaged. And that's quite typical of, of houses that are older. Untreated framing, lots and lots of untreated framing um, use. And that has a whole lot of ramifications about how you remediate it to make sure that you, it stops it and how far it goes. But if you've got well-treated framing, then it's, it's a way, way better scenario because the framing only tends to rot as far as it, the water can attack the, the treatment level. So it slows it down and you get discrete areas typically rather than major areas. But again, it depends on the treatment level and some of those are really depending on what the treatment level was. Some, some are as good as nothing at all. They're only insect treatment, really. There's, so there's a variance in them, and that has a big effect on what happens in the remedial project. So we, what, we, what we want is a win today and a win tomorrow. Okay. So just as at the start of any re re remediation or alteration, people like myself um, can be used to identify deficiencies in the building um, and give the designers a better understanding of what's happening before they have to remediate. And that's a classic example, it's the school building I'm involved in. And you look at the building and you go, and it's the most beautiful building, but it's got so many issues in terms of junctions and connections, and, uh, and that's only part of it that you can see. It's, you know, it's a building with a car park in the middle, with the classrooms above and the classrooms below, and, and plus other wonderful things going on with it. So before anybody can hope to achieve a remedial solution, you have to understand what's, why it's failing. What are the issues? Why is it leaking? And God help any designer that uh, can sort this one out, because they, they will be able to, but it's like, you know, sometimes keeping it simple, stupid, works really well compared to complicated. So one of the principal things that you need to be aware of is that th is what you're trying to achieve in terms of code compliance. And the Building Act is quite clear on, on what those things are, actually. <coughs> building work must comply with the building code doesn't matter whether it's consented work or unconsented work, you need to comply with the building code. 
And by that, I mean the building code, not the AS, acceptable solutions, which people keep confusing. You know, it's about the building code. Performance-based is, is really important. And I just, it just presses me when everyone keeps talking about the solutions, the acceptable solutions, and I say, no, building code. What does the building code require you to do? Is the building performing like it should be? And it, it just, that, and that's the guts of it, really. Just how you get there sometimes is where the solutions come in, of course. So the act lists responsibilities towards parties that are involved in that work, so the responsibilities of the builder, and I've just highlighted the parts that are really appropriate for this, but it's again they're talking about ensuring that the building work not covered by building consent complies with building code. So it's again, it's all about, it doesn't matter what you do, just make sure it complies with building code. And I don't care how you build it, as long as it complies with building code. Councils will have a slightly different view, but that's, that's, the, you know, that's, that's, that's the nuts of it, the guts of it. Same with the designer building work must comply with the building code. And again, it's about how does the building perform? Will it perform like the building code requires? Those basic, basic stuff. Warm, dry, durable, all those sort of things. Um, even the owner has a responsibility. So um, you know, even again, if there's no building consent, it must com the work must comply with the building code. And it's really important, I get a lot of, um, I, I get quite a few builders now, young builders, which really, I just love it when these young guys ring up and they say, the owner wants me to do, they've got a leak and they want me to fix it, but I'm a bit scared that I'm not going to do enough, that she won't let me do enough work for me to fix it. And I go, well, I can come and have a look for you if you want me to, we can have a talk about it, we can figure out whether in fact that is the, that, you know, what she wants you to do is fair and reasonable, because if you don't fix, if you only fix that part, but it's leaking everywhere else, you've got a problem and she's going to sell the house, guarantee it, and you're going to end up with a, and, and, and the house has all been fixed, She's because he came and fixed it, it's all cool, but actually, you know, it's not fixed, and the new owner, and your liability carries on to the new owner, always think about the new owner, because that's, um, that's just always around the corner, often with a lot of work we do. They would expect that, really, that, work to, that thing to be fixed, and you have to be really clear about when you stop and you start, when you do those repairs, so um, in many cases I say to the builders, just walk away from it. Don't get involved. Unless you can do it properly, don't go there. And they look at me and they, and they get it. And then, they, and then they often will me later on and say, look, are we doing enough here? Is that going to work? And once they get it, you know, it's <coughs> job done because it keeps them safe and it makes everyone safe all the way down the track, actually. The only person that doesn't like it often is the homeowner who thought that, you know, they could get away with a minor repair. And they don't really know. So, so and here's an example, and I'll come back to this one, but... Um, it was only a kitchen renovation and an addition, um, but no one checked first. It was just a, uh, you know, it was like, yeah, we want to add this kitchen on, but no one actually thought about the structure prior to the designer coming in and designing the, the designer just designed a new bit, and that was it. And I'll come back to that one. And it's not a spectacular example, but it's common. And that particular style of building is, in Wellington at least, is extremely common. That's 1920s stucco, clearly stucco building. You can guarantee that every one of those buildings, well, not every one, but a lot of them, they look pretty good on the outside, but you get them to them and they're pretty stuffed you know, in terms of framing and the whole thing. They've been around a long time. They've been doing their thing. They've done what they have to do, but they aren't always as good inside as they look on the outside. Okay. Um, so I was going to say about the two happy faces in the building there, um, why the... You know, really, it's, it's about looking after everybody's risk, but we'll come back to that. So one of the things we'll touch on and something that's come up recently again in the media, very recently, is um, under Schedule 1. Um, my builder said, I can do all this work under Schedule 1, I don't need a building consent. Well, is it true or false? It might be true, it might be false, but there's a lot of misconceptions out there and it's not helped by um, MB don't really clarify it particularly well. They give, I wrote a, wrote a letter to MB um, last week and I said, stop using baby language. Tell us, tell us how it really is. Actually... Define some, de define some of the wording in the X and try and be more helpful so people don't get this, well, maybe, no, they, they really don't help, their examples aren't very helpful for people. So under Schedule 1, under the Building Act, you, some of you will be aware um, that you can do a lot of repair and replacement of similar components. We should probably understand that without a building consent, that's not really a problem. What a lot of people fail to understand is that unless it has failed to satisfy the provisions of the building code for durability, for example, through a failure to comply with the external moisture requirements of the building code. So that, in a nutshell, means if it's a leaky building 
and it's got some framing damage, then you really need a building incentive to repair it. That, that's, the, that's the guts of it. Um, and not everybody understands that. Most builders don't, of course, because it takes a bit more reading and a bit more knowledge. Um, and that's one of the areas that's very badly descri uh, described under the MB's guidelines about what does need a consent and what doesn't. And I appreciate it's a difficult one, actually. Um, but that's one of the important parts. That if, if it's leaking and you go to reclad it and you find it's got damaged framing, you really have to have a building <coughs> consent. Now, there's an exception to that, actually, um, which MB haven't replied to me and they probably don't want to, but it talks about failure of durability. Durability is defined within the Building Act from the date of the issue of the Code Compliance Certificate, and then it relates to the 5, 15, 50 years. But any pr building pre-92, of course, didn't have a Code Compliance Certificate. So my question to MB is, well, this doesn't apply to those buildings because the definition doesn't apply of durability. And it's obviously a mis it's, it's obviously a, an omission in the Act somewhere. I don't think that was the intention. I think the intention was if you've got a building and it's got substantial damage framing, particularly with a modern building with untreated timber, you need to have council look at it so that it can be repaired in a way that everybody going forward has an understanding that it will work. But anyway, there's nothing in the, you know, it looks like it excludes pre-92 Act buildings under the old regime. But just be aware of that, that, that part there so that you have a bit better guidance. Um, so this is something that we run into quite a lot, um, and there's been poor and the illegal repairs, and by illegal I mean that they didn't get a building consent. That's the Schedule 1 exemption that they didn't, and that's just an ex example of, of one where um, you can see the black framing, decayed framing, you can see new framing beside it, but the, the decayed framing's still there. Uh, there's lots of evidence of repairs. And guess what? It still leaks, and that's because they haven't understood why it leaked in the first place, and they haven't done the right, the right thing to repair it. So, you know, the, you, there's legal claims going on about so that so the homeowners involved because they did the repairs, they didn't uh, disclose it to the to the new purchasers. The builder might be involved. I, I don't know. There's a whole other parties involved in the legal claim for that work, and actually it's not just that work; it's the whole house. But that's just a typical example of why you have to do it properly. Um, and why it needed a building consent. So um, there's another example, different house. There's one I saw the other day. Somebody's you know, found there's a problem, they've gone and repaired the framing, and it still leaks, again, still leaks. And in fact, the framing, you can see the new framing, see it's starting to, to deteriorate, and it's, um, it's on its way out as well. And that's a common example, and I really understand why people do it, I understand why builders do it, they're doing the best they can to make it, make it structurally sound but they haven't really dealt with the problem and if you think back all the work you do has to comply with the building code the builder hasn't done what the ex asks him to do and so the builder should have said I if I can't do that repair properly I shouldn't be doing it at all and and with the exception of temporary repairs um, he shouldn't be involved really in that work because if you can't keep the water out you can't make it if you can't keep the water out it's not code compliant Structurally, it's not compliant because the framing's not up to standard for the required periods. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it sort of gets problematic, and you just need to be aware of those things. And the outcomes will be way better if, it, if we can get this through into the building industry about doing it properly. That was a consented repair, just a typical example of, of, of framing. And it's part of the reason why councils get involved in um, in getting building surveyors involved because that you find so many builders think that's acceptable. After we've been through and we've been through the projects with them, they are so different. In fact, the guys I work with regularly, because it seems to be the way it comes up, you know, they basically say, oh, we're not starting this job, can we take the rotten framing out? And I go, as long as I don't see any rotten framing when I get on site, I'm happy. Because they, you know that they know what they're doing, they, they know what, what, what's required and they're really onto it. I think that's quite acceptable and um, they don't understand that untreated framing can, can continue to rot and decay. There's lots of issues. Besides, it's not, it's not safe. By the way, if you've got any questions, and, and it's really, well, I should have said, sing out because we need, this is, it should be an interactive type of thing. So if you've got some questions and queries and you want to raise a point, even if it's a point something back, 
we've got you know, quite a lot of time, I think, so um, just get this thing out and um, throw, throw something out there and, and get discussion going, it'd be good. Okay, so back to this beauty. Um, so, so what that was about is simply, and it's just a simple example, but the part of highlighted was involved in a remedial alteration in the Greta kitchen and, and they were doing repairs around there. And they started doing the they started doing the work and I came along as a timber remediation specialist because the council looked at going, oh, framing rot and decay, we need to appoint a building surveyor. Just as a point, councils can't do that as part of the consent process. There's a determination that came out and said that they can't they can't request that prior to the issue of the consent. They have to issue the consent in the normal course and then if during the process they find that it's looking a bit there's damage and decay, then they can ask for one to be involved. It's just a subtle point and it's one that sometimes the councils forget that <coughs> even, the, even the councils that have had the determination that went against them still forget it and they try and sometimes get it into the consent process. And it's just semant semantics I suppose, but, but it is just the way it is. So they, pulled, they started doing the work there and underneath the house they found all the bearers were decayed. And, and actually you probably could have guessed that and they probably weren't surprised by that. So that's in itself not really a big issue, I don't think. The, you know, these guys just really experienced builders. To them, it's just another day in the office, and they just dug down and redid the foundations, and, did, and that was that was part <laughs> and parcel of it. But what they didn't see, and I pointed out to them, is if you look at the windows, the, the window up above. You know, we're talking a 1920s, 30s stucco house, and they, as you will be aware, have internal flashings, metal flashings, and under the windows. Well, it's been there a hell of a long time. And they rust and they corrode, and so he and, and there was clearly cracks down from the, from the windows running down through the cladding. And typically, whenever you see a crack in the cladding, and I know I'm talking to somebody, people in Christchurch about cracks in buildings. Mostly, with take the earthquake scenario out of it, it's water damage that causes those gets into cladding, and causes that failures, particularly fibre cement cladding systems. Well, that was the case there. The stucco was clearly cracked on, on the edge, and you knew that you'd go look at it. And go, oh, well, that's not working, is it? And you know, what, and if you expect that after all that time, it probably wouldn't be working. So I said, well, all that those leaks up there that be coming down on top of your new work, how's that going to work? Look, work out for you. And the um, and of course the guys, you can see their little their faces there, and they were like, oh yeah, yeah, and they sort of thought about it. And I said, well, you need to keep yourself safe. Because chances are these people will sell the house in, in year nine and in year ten, you'll someone will knock on your door and say, "Oh, it's all leaking down through into the ceiling of the new, the new addition." And by the way, all the framing is rotten up there. How's that going to go for you? And they go, "Oh, yeah." So the thing was, then you go back to the owner and say, "Look, these these guys have to keep themselves safe. There's no point doing this work if it's failing up top. You need to look at recladding and redealing with that part of the building." And that doesn't go down particularly well because lady wants a new kitchen and you know and there's lots of extra money but and you get this really quite blunt response and then the funny thing happens is that they start thinking about it and they work through the process and they tell the builders to go and do the work they reclad the building and they just flip completely and they become really on board with the project and then they say well yeah it's probably like that around the rest of the building we will we'll work through it as we as we can and they're quite feeling really good about the project now that they realise that actually they've probably dodged a bullet and they've dealt with this and it's all dealt with. So it's quite an interesting change how people, and you would see it all the time with designers, how they change in the process of how they work. And it's a, it's a good thing, but sometimes you have to bring the bad news and the end result, there's always a better end result. It's just, it's just money, unfortunately. So builders safe, homeowners safe, anybody that buys the house, at least that part of the building will be working like it should be, which is a good thing. Okay, so it's really common in, in what I do and lots of people do to find extensive framing decay in buildings and it's not just modern leaky buildings. If you remember back to that first slide, that 1980s building, so common and you go back to this even now 70s, 60s, 70s buildings where they've, they've been around for a long time now and we grew up in them, we thought they were just, that's what they, they were just new buildings then, they were just, but actually they, they're getting old, like all of us, and it's, it's 
at times, you know, as water gets in, it just it does its thing. So it's more and more common now to find these buildings spread right back. And then you go back to the early 1800, well, late 1800s, early 1900s buildings. And some of those buildings are in really bad condition. You know, once you actually look, this whole concept of a nice, beautiful built villa forgets that actually if water's getting in, the same thing's going to happen to them as it does to any other building. It just takes a bit longer, but they've already had that length of time. So um, that's, the, that's the guts there. Um, things like that, that's, that's far, too, far too common. And that was actually on a school, and that's again far too common as well, unfortunately. And it's about durability. It's about making products that, putting on systems that work. We should never have buildings like that, especially in our schools that are only 10, 15, or probably just over 10 years, 15 years old, I suppose. And there's just something basically so wrong in what we do that creates this rubbish, and it's about getting away from that whole concept back to that durability, providing those durable concepts. And that's, a, that's a, a interesting, that example there, that's all stachybotrys, and if you don't know what stachybotrys is, that's the toxigenic fungi that can cause respiratory problems, and it's mostly a bit of a beat up in terms of actual real time effects. Um, the, if you talk to the lecturers from the Targa University, they normally tell you that after 24 hours, if, you, if you've been in an environment where you've been badly affected by it, all the, effect, all the symptoms are gone. But if you're living in an environment like that, of course, it's no good for you at all if you've got respiratory problems. And so if you just look at the, 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 the jib board there, you'll see all that swirly black mould, <coughs> and it's always an indicator generally of Dachybotrys. Um, not always, but mostly you can just assume that it is, because mostly it will always will be. Now, that's an example where the builder, and I'm not really a big health and safety fan, big, big picture, I mean, some of it's good, but anyway, so the builder rang up and said, uh, all my guys, I've taken the cladding off, all my guys have got respiratory masks, and I thought, oh, really? So that's, but I, I thought, well, that's a bit over the top, isn't it? Because yeah, builders don't normally you know, always do that. But, but I went to the site, and they hadn't pulled off all the, the wrap, and it was it was a fibre cement system. So I had to pull off some of the wrap just so I could see the frame and get to that product. And these guys were working with the respirator masks on, and I just did what I normally do, I pulled it off. And within about 20 minutes, I got quite a bad headache. And it was really definitely, uh, you know, and all the spores were being whizzing around, and that definitely had an effect. And it cleared up quite quickly once I got back into fresh air. Oh, I just said to the guy, oh, well done for putting the mask on. You know, that was a case where it was really a good thing to, to do. And it's just an example of how toxic these buildings can get. And again, if you. How old was the house when you got there? I was maybe 10, 12, 14 years old. Yeah. It's just, a, again, it's, it's these, and that was a result of. Fibre cement recessed, uh, negative detail fibre cement sheet cladding. Um, and it's common, really common. Even when it's on a cavity, it still happens far too much. Um, you can screen cavities at a root solution. So so th you can screen cavities at a root solution. Oh, it's uh, a problem. Uh, oh, we, yeah. um, like, I'm from the States, and what we typically do is we've got two layers of protection. So yeah. we do a substrate. relying on a vapor barrier, which essentially is just between the moisture and the, the cladding, you know, is that the right way? And is in the future equal cladding to fail because it gets pretty much the full cancer as well? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah, can, yeah, I know you do it in a different, and you have the issues with cold, don't you? So the vapor barriers and ice and freeze, so you have to be where, careful where you put it and all that. So, and the, so your climate zones can be different depending on what part of the state. But what I did realize going through, we went to Vegas, Las Vegas for a conference, is that people in the States, such a big area, that every area is geographically so different that it was like they were all from different parts of the world. And, and so you, your conditions, but in terms of cavity, way, way better than having drink fixed, absolutely. But if you don't get your detail right, and what concerns me about some of these systems, and I was looking at a brand new system, brand new fibre cement system being glued on, glued on yesterday, glued on, is that it still was designed to let water run down the back of the cladding, actually. And I'm going, how's this ever going to work? And especially with a glued on system, how's glue and water going to work? And how's the substrate that absorbs moisture and in contact with a, with a glue system that requires that substrate to be dry and ch not change? You know, and I thought a, a cladding panel fell off a building in Auckland last week, week before. 
and it was a fixed screw or, or nail fixed system. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that, a lot more, because some of these systems now, I'm probably getting distracted, but they, they're really loose on this, on this, a lot of the systems, and you, the wood has pores in the back of them, and I think, you know, if you've got a cladding system that's a, on a cavity, it's designed as a sort of a secondary system, as a safety zone, it's not designed to let water <coughs> down, it's not the, although maybe that's perhaps the, 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 the subconscious intent, but it shouldn't still let water get in behind. And if you've got water getting in behind, then it's, it has some effect, it has to have some effect. And there's plenty of examples of rotten battens and water crossing the battens and different places getting around them when it's still getting in. And it was, I went to a brand new house only not that long ago, and it was again a fibre cement system, it was a weatherboard system and a sheet system combined. And the council wouldn't give it a code compliance because they weren't happy about some of the details. And I went round with the moisture meter and there's water in the internal linings around the windows. And it was on the cavity. And, oh boy. and it was like, but it was, and it hadn't been constructed quite the way it should have been. And the, the sheets weren't quite big enough so the window cover wasn't, you know, there's often only tiny little gaps between the padding. And in this case it was even less than tiny gap in some places, you know, so that's why the water was getting in. But it still wasn't, the, the, the cladding, the cavity system wasn't managing it. And it was just another leaky building. Well, it was water was in it, it was new, and it was, you know, and, and you go. And I think my advice to the, to, the, to the builder, who unfortunately built it for his sister, which made life complicated for him, um, is that, you can just imagine it, imagine it, is that get rid of this rubbish system and put weatherboard on or something and make it work like it should be um, and durable. So it's that, you know, that's that durability thing. So, um, yeah. Cavities are a really good example of really good things, but they still have to be worked to keep the water out. I think that's the, that's the big thing. So, um, so that's another example, and, th and that was a deck in Wellington that I walked on with a lawyer and an architect, and it was only a small corner deck, but it was a hell of a big drop. It was a big drop down below, and I just said, to "Guys, we have to get off this deck. It doesn't feel right." And I went back a few days later and I just cut a hole and that was one, there was only two uh, boundary joists onto this corner deck and that was one of them. And I just put my finger right through the, it was like, well, we, we dodged a bullet really because it wouldn't have taken much for something to break. And that's quite common. You find that, unfortunately, a lot. And again, there's a fibre fibre cement system, direct fixed. But if you've got a cladding system that sucks up water, you know, what's, you know, it's, what's going to happen? It's, um, it's not, it's not going to be good, so you, you anything that sucks water up is water absorbent, unless it can really shed, which is why weatherboards are really good, because they shed all the way down water, and to get water out makes, it makes a huge difference. I mean, so we talked about untreated timber, well, you can see how wet that wood is on the side once I've taken the fibre cement off, and there's a hoo-hoo grub. Now the hoo-hoo grub, you find that in your paddock, you find that in the bush, you find it in rotten logs. It didn't know any different, because that's the same thing. It's just a, it's just a wet bit of timber, and we build. Well, we're not building with that tim untreated now, but there's thousands of them out there, and they're not all as bad as that. But that's, um, you know, it tells a story, doesn't it? Very compostable buildings, and again, it's about durability. Um, something to think about too is that um, when you're looking at, especially older buildings, untreated native framing buildings, be really careful. Tim, um, borer damage is a, insect damage is a big issue. The house I looked at yesterday was, it made that, that timber look really good, but it was so bad, it was just, it was just powdery, the whole thing was just this big powdery in so many places. And the other, other bits of sticks, sticks of timber that was hard was fine. But it, it wasn't something that the, that the builder had considered when he first started doing that work. Uh, it made, um, makes it makes a big difference to how you project. And just even things like that, uh, uh, you see that in the, up on the roof. And if you hit that with a hammer, there's a very good chance that that, that rafter will just fall to bits. It would, would be very close to just falling to bits. As the previous photo, that was just split off the wood. And whilst that stuff all tends to stay together, um, you know, if you're doing a remedial project, you can't really leave it there if it's, if it's, if it's in the work area that you're working on. So again, it's about thinking about the bigger picture, about what you do and how you do it. 
because it's, it's sometimes a bit wider than you think that it might be. Um, so back to timber remediation. So, so someone like myself comes along to a site, we've been asked by the council, has typically said to the builder, you need a timber remediation specialist to look at the, look at the framing because we're not happy. We want to make sure that the building is going to be code compliant. And so we go along, and then we, we after the cladding's removed, and we look at the, and it, we always, after the cladding's removed, it's an important part, we don't do it prior, don't ever look at framing just with, with the jib board removed. And one of the reasons for that is that the wet side of the wood is the outside, and you'll often see, say, pre purchase inspectors will go and they'll put a camera inside and they'll look inside the frame and they go, yeah, it's all, it's all really good. Well, they're only looking at the dry side, they're only looking at one, one elevation of, of four bits of wood and often it's just the dry side of the wood and just beyond the part that they can't see is the part that the, that the cladding is all jammed up and, it's, and that's the wet side and so it's really common to find that when you take the framing, the cladding off, that the part that you couldn't see is all decayed, particularly if it's sitting on, on, a, um, on a timber, uh, uh, sorry, a, a concrete floor, for example, where the moisture can't drain away the same. Or a Rimu is a really good example. Rimu framing can look great on the outside. You can just touch it and it falls to bits and you can't see it. It's, it's So you have to be really careful and say, so we don't do anything until the cladding is taken off because the moment you do that, and you see lots of builders will take the jib off and go, yeah, it's all good, it's all great. Well, they can't see the boundary joist down below either. They can't see that. They can't see the uh, second story, the joist above, which is where the water sits, it comes down, sits and then runs along. So what they're looking at is really the wrong area and it's very misleading and it's dangerous and it's about keeping yourself safe because what you don't want to do is to do a remedial job and say, oh, we'll just reclad this part or we'll just do this work. And again, the owner sells the house, the work's done, the new owner comes in and suddenly they find a problem and then, and then and before you know it, there's a lawyer involved and it gets, just, it gets horrible. So it's about avoiding, avoiding it, keeping yourself safe, doing it properly, look at the big picture. Holistic picture look is really good rather than just focused on what the person's asking you to do initially. Um, that's quite a good example, that photo of a, of, of a boundary joist, but you see it's decayed there, but it didn't actually look immediately obviously decayed until you just pulled it apart, and then you'll see actually once you get into it, once you get that little shell off, it is actually quite decayed. So it's just a trap, so just be aware. Um, so there's some um, partially repaired framing, and, and what you can see there is, is new framing installed. You can see the old framing, new bottom plates going in, and if you can see some of the bottom of the studs, there's some red paint. Do you all know, know what that is? You know, that's, that's so it's Proton Frame Saver is, is what that is. It's, so it's a boron additive. Now, that timber will be untreated timber. So when it was first, it's got no treatment level in it um, for any, so it's got no resistance to, to fungal decay. And what I've asked the builders to do there is when they've cut the bottom plate out, because the bottom plate was rotten or needed replacing, that they've painted underneath the cut on the studs. And the, you'll see there's a double plate there. Actually, the, the, I've gotten the cut up, uh, up the stud, put a double plate in, so you're cutting off the bottom piece where there the could be some decay, and then applying the frame saver, so it sucks up into the, into the bottom of the stud to give it some preservation. And then you'll see, so proton frame saver is, um, is a boron based additive, and it, you paint it to the frame in a couple of coats, and it brings your framing up to as close as you get it to H, say 1.2. It's not as good as because it doesn't have the penetration. But the reason that you'll use that as opposed to, say, Metal X, for example, is that they act in quite different ways. And the Metal X, one has a different chemical in it, but it also has a wax sort of a product, and so it's more suitable for posts and bare, uh, exterior things where you're going to go on the ground or treat it to uh, H3, H4, where you might cut and make paint the ends. But what it does is it tends to seal that piece of wood in a, sur in a, in a surface capacity. The frame saver, uh, actually if it gets wet, or uh, is applied to wet wood, particularly if it's damp wood, it draws, the water draws that frame saver up into the timber so it penetrates further. So if the wood gets wet again, then you've got this extra resilience there because it, it will draw that wood further into where the decay might be and, and help keep that wood a bit more durable. Very early on when I was doing this, where 
and have that frame shape and use magnetic yeah. Components. Yeah, well, you can use it, but I don't recommend it. And there's two reasons. One is it stinks. And I've, yeah. I've been to a house where the people have to move out because the builders just use it on the frame. It's, oh, it's really, really strong. But it doesn't work as well in terms of interior framing because it doesn't penetrate. And if you've got decay inside the wood, then um, you, you really want it to get in as best you can. So that's why the frame tape is better. And it doesn't smell the same. Um, but but the different horses, different courses, and you know, don't discount metal X. Um, I did recently a job where they wanted to put Pro Climber fishing tape on, and it wouldn't stick to the metal X timber. And they tested and they found a stick that the stick adhered to the uh, metal X around the. So they put metal X around the windows, and then the rest they did frame tape. Uh, a, pro a protum, P R O T I M. Placemakers normally supply it. Just for some reason, they sometimes have the odd bottle of clear, or can it, and don't use clear because you don't know where it's been. You can't see it. You always go for the red. And the other thing about it, you'll see it as it com comes along, is that. So there it is again. So um, that's <coughs> where we've had to apply it to, say, untreated timber where we think it's at risk or it may have been wet. So we're, we're just making that wood more durable. Uh, that's a really good coat, two coats of frame saver, and it varies. Some wood, it goes really red. Some wood, it doesn't. It just depends on the nature of the wood, I think, as to how it works on the surface or gets absorbed in. But if you apply it to remove framing, which on occasions I've had to do that, because it's also an insect killer, it's, it acts good for, for insects, um, is that it makes it look like furniture. And it's really fascinating to watch the the psychological effect that when the builders put the stuff on, suddenly they look at this framing like it's something else, and they sort of stand back and go, "Oh, it looks pretty." You know, there's that, you can see them taking a pride in their work, and it's it's like you're dressing the framing, and suddenly it's not just gungy old framing; it's something else that these guys can actually. They sort of it helps. It just helps the flow of the project. It looks better. Owners like it. It looks like they've done something. So that's another example where it's been applied to framing and. Um, it, each timber remediation specialist will have a different view, possibly on to the degree that you apply it and where you need to apply it. Some of the bigger companies perhaps might do it religiously regardless on all framing. Um, I tend to take the approach based on durability, service life, how long it's been, what it's been doing, what it's going to do, what the, the, the wood was prior, how much water entry it's had. So I take a pragmatic approach and some will need it, some won't. And I don't see any point in adding cost to a construction project if it doesn't actually need it. In some cases, particularly some of the earlier um, treated pine, are much more durable. The, the wood's different because modern timber is softer, it's grown genetically, so all the trees are the same. If you look at some of the 70s, 80s framing, it looks a bit rougher, but the wood generally is a lot denser. And um, I think the treatment levels were probably better actually at the time as well. And you find some buildings that have had quite a lot of water in them. And, but the framing's still actually really good compared to some of the modern bits of framing where it's been wet and it rots in five minutes for comparatively. And there's lots of reasons for that, as well as the treatment levels, the different types of treatments that might be in the, whether it be at boron treated timber or LOSP treated timber, and there's a couple of others as well. So for me, it's horses for courses. Um, and um, we just, so. Um, something else we've been involved in a bit too is. Um, where houses have been built and they've been left out in the open too long and the council's looked at the framing and gone, oh, it, looks, it looks a bit black. What, you know, and they get us sometimes to have a look at that and, and work out a way of remediating the framing and make sure that it's going to be durable for the oncoming at least 50 years. So that's something that's happening a bit as well. Um, it's always a bit of a concern because you know that the f something's gone wrong with the project to have the framing out exposed for, for too long. Anyway, it's um, and actually it's turned out to be true because that particular house, I w that's been in construction now probably 18 months at least. I went past it on the weekend and it's still not cleared. It's wrecked and it's boarded up, so you know that it's, it's gone pear shaped. Unfortunately for the owner, uh, and that's a classic case also of poor supervision, where you've got a an Auckland-based builder who employs carpenters, labour-only staff on site, and poor supervision. It's really important to have good supervision in the projects. Even things like bolts not being done up, you know, just or no nuts on the bolt. 
just really nuts, crazy things, which we should be way past in terms of our, you know, where we are with building standards, and it's again, it's about poor supervision and lack of understanding in many cases as well, even by the LPV, I think. Um, I think the, I think the, oh, each manufacturer has a different, but I think it's three to four months in that range. And that, that was quite a lot longer. But I think that's conservative. I think actually it's, you know, if, if it's well treated, it um, can go a lot longer than that. But it just depends on how long it stays wet for. Because framing like that, of course, will get wet, but it'll dry, wet, dry. <coughs> so it's not like it's sitting, but on a concrete floor, of course, it's different. Your base plates will be sitting off in water for a long time and that's not good. So, so sometimes the remedial solution here is to replace some of the bait bottom plates because they are way, way more affected than, than some of the framing. So it's horses for courses, but it does happen, unfortunately. Um, okay, there's, there's actually a rule. Um, for, for, there's, there's called the meter rule, as you might have heard of. The meter rule was, was really designed for untreated framing. Because untreated framing, then the fungi can run long lengths in the in the wood, and so you need to make a judgment call when you're on site about how far back you go, depending on how bad the damage is and and, and where the area is. And that's so it doesn't mean that you would. And, and I've seen it recently where some people that should have known better went to a site, and they basically they they drew a. Like they, there was a bit of decay between some window at the window corners. They basically got a, a compass, as it seemed like, and they drew a metre right round the window and said, oh, that one needs replacing. And you're going, no, because there's multiple sticks of timber and you're only really talking about the, the sticks of timber that will be affected by the fungi because it won't jump across unless it's very wet. You know, all those are wet, but often they're separated enough so that the, the, the fungi won't go between different sticks. Um, and so you have to make it, just look at it and work out where, where it's sensible to change it and where it's not. And again, if you've got treated timber, often the treatment will, will resist the, the fungal attack, but it will work its way back from a specific leak point and work its way back slowly. But it depends at what point that is and where you have to chop it. So it's just a, um, it's just a matter of making a judgment call. It'll become pretty obvious actually once you start cutting the wood that where, where it's good and where it's, where it's not good. Um, yeah, well, sometimes, sometimes you might, re yeah, you might do look like lintels and things. Uh, you might replace those, um, and you might actually sometimes take out whole sections of wall. And, and quite often, it's if you've got a badly damaged wall, but there might be areas that are undamaged. You might, because it's cheaper, just just to, just to cut the whole wall out and reframe it, because labour is the expensive component, and you don't really want builders mucking around trying to cut bits out and stitch and so. You, so often you just say, look, mark this up from here to there, just take it out and the builder goes, yep, sweet, great, because he just quickly demolishes that wall and just reframes it completely new. Now, it's, it's way better result and it's actually cheaper to do it that way because there's way less labour cost. So that's a sort of structural consideration, but quite often you're actually replacing stuff for structural reasons, but you're not doing it to the degree where you're testing for strength of the timber. You, you know, it's a judgement call where, you, where you, you need to look at it and work out whether it's still going to be fit for purpose. And that's the good thing about timber, really. It's quite a durable product. You know, we bang it and we drill it and we cut it and we do all sorts of things to it. And it's, you know, there's lots of things hanging on that hold it together so it becomes a nice big structural unit. So it's not normally, if it's a structural problem, you'll know pretty quick you know, when you look at it, how much you have to replace and what you have to don't or don't. Does that make sense? I don't tell the builders how to build their framing, just, um, but it's, normally you have the DPC underneath it, which is normally enough, but if, because the water is only there because, say, the roof hasn't been on, or so once you've got the roof on, of course, it's going to dry, and it's not going to be the same scenario, and normally by the time we get involved, the cladding's look, and the cladding is normally starting to go on, or the roof's on, and in fact, that case is a good example, the roof is now on, um, they, have, have wrap on it for most of it, and um, so the water problem starts to go away. So, um, <laughs> so I, I don't get involved in that. But.
and, and Jimmy. So Jimmy's not really a problem. So this is another example of the surface treated uh, after removal of the deck. And then you um, bear it across the top. And so what we've done there is frame save the untreated framing that was under that deck. And that gives it durability for the future. And so again, if it gets wet, that moisture is going to take that boron further into the wood and give it more durability. But it's not going to get wet in theory. So, um, so at the end of the end of the, the work, um, I do a timber remediation certificate. Other building surveyors do a report. Everybody's a bit, bit different. Council will have their own QA documents that's required to give quality assurance towards getting your code compliance certificate. Um, so that's so that's so that's one of the other benefits of it is that if you're not sure when you're doing a project, it's another quality project indicator that gives somebody down the track confidence that the work's been done properly. Because uh, one of the things is if somebody says to me, um, yeah, we reclad the house, it was all reclad, it was all done properly, and I go, oh yeah, so how do you know it has? Because the builder said it has, and they've got really no idea whether it has or hasn't been done. But, and I don't either, as a, say as a purchaser or a surveyor, <coughs> if, if I don't know what they've done with the framing, I've really got no confidence that that remedial work was actually any good because that's an important component and quite often you find, and we've got some examples where we've had to reclad the building a third time. And when you pull the cladding off, you find that the framing replacement levels have been appalling. The, the, you know, some of those other photos, the damage that's been done and not properly repaired really is, is, is appalling. So as a purchaser, I'd have way more confidence when you know it's been done right and there's documentary evidence to show it's been done properly because you know it's right because it's an important part of that project. So that's it. So if you've got any other... Is there something we should be putting in our documentation when it is going to be timber you know, here that you could be building or do it or do money instead to make sure that the timber is inspected and to a certain quality? Is there a general note we should be putting in the drawings to make sure that it's hard for me to say because that's sort of a quality it's your own quality and, and it's probably it might be a good idea um, quite often councils will issue a quality assurance document which everybody has to um, everybody will I think you might have one in your next yeah, there's one, yeah, there's one in, in Kim's presentation so so you'll see where the council said the, you know this has been done and tick 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 and some of that's for the designer some or well, for the builder Yeah, it's sort of part of a bigger quality, but it's really good to have a, Q a QA document of some sort on site, so you just at least know some of these things are being done, because um, some of our quality is pretty poor. It has well, been. A lot of the times the builders don't want the architect or the designer to fall and say, well, my client's got one pay for construction line, yeah. which would have efficiently been done in the first three months. So, yeah, yeah. so it's just, I guess, assuring that, making sure that it's all being done in accordance with the client's respective documents. Yes, and at, that, and at that point, of course, you'd make sure you're well out of it, wouldn't you? you you'd be cut, you, you'd sort of, well, that's where we stop and start, and that's an important part. And don't be like one of the New Zealand's famous architects, I was involved in a, in a, a legal dispute, where he sort of got dragged back into the building every now and again, and just sort of, you know, kept an eye on things, and to really as a favour to the owner, and he didn't, that, that delineation wasn't clear, and I think that was, so he, he got seen by the judge as being supervisory role. So you have to be really clear about your, you know, what where you're doing, you're stopping your start. And it's the same with builders and everybody, be really clear where you're doing your stopping your start. And if you're gonna start a project, know it's from that wall to that wall and make that cl really clear. It's not this other piece and we're not saying that the rest of the building is performing. We're only just talking about the code compliance component involved in this, this section. It's, re it's really, really important. And then there's no confusion and it keeps you safe because you don't want to be dragged back and you say, well, we didn't really touch that. And they say, oh, yeah, but, but then they drag you back in for some funny reason. So it's so by putting that part in, yes, it's a really good thing, but it, you have to be careful you're not then setting yourself up to fall into the next part that you're not involved in. That would be my thought. Uh, 
Um, Yeah, um, why, I'm, why I'm thinking is because my part of my background, that I, used, I came from foreign general insurance industry, actually, and I've been a district manager of an insurance company and lots of different things as part of my part of my background. And I understand that there's a, that the earth gets this leaky building thing and the earthquake repair thing somehow gets mixed together, and there's this thing that the insurers are saying, well, oh, that's leaky building, we're not paying for that. And I don't quite know how that fits together because I know how I think it should fit together or not fit together. It's either earthquake damage and there might be some other framing repairs that need to be, that, you know, if it's rotten, it's clearly rotten and the only person that should pay for that is the homeowner because it's not actually an earthquake. But the building's been damaged because it's damaged by an earthquake and the building is, is insured as a building and buildings aren't perfect. They all have their deficiencies and they just do what buildings do. And I know that somewhere along the way they sort of fit this, oh, we won't pay for that because that's a leaky building. But the building didn't need fixing because it wasn't damaged except for the earthquake. So your proximate cause comes in. And I, I don't know quite how that works, but I'm, I just think that somehow it's wrong, part of it, and it's wrong. But, but, but you often find situations where um, the water is, so the damage is from an internal leak. It's, it's not necessarily external leak, it might be an internal leak. And yes, that might be an insurance um, issue. But actually, off what, what what we're there for is, well, it depends what we're there for, and again, it's about being careful about what you're doing. And I always make sure I know I'm there because, for this reason, I'm not there for this other reason. And quite often, I get requests, "Can you come into the site and do this?" But while you're there, can you look at this other stuff? And I go, "Well, I can do this, but I'm not sure I can help you on that because that's not what I'm there for, or maybe I don't want to get involved in that because that's got a high reliability risk." It might be that I've written a report previously that's told somebody what how to fix that in a generic way, but they just want to try and see whether maybe I've changed my mind or whether whether I think that maybe because the bill is on site, you can just sealant this or sealant that. And you don't want to get into that scenario. You just got to do it properly. So your advice is always do it properly, um, even though there might be a, a simpler solution in the short term. In the long term, it won't work. And that's why you don't want to be involved in it. Uh, if that sort of helps you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, it's, and, 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 and the good, yeah, they're good discussions to have because you need to talk about those things. About so, how do you deal with um, situations where the uh, building used to be direct to gas and now the current case is it has to be an EPRD, but the insurance company is saying that they don't need to pay for it? Well, you did, well, well, then you turn around and say, well, you obtain the consent. You try and do it on direct fix to see how it works for you. It's not going to work very well, is it? And it's always been the case, and, and I'm, actually, I'm actually chartered loss adjuster, although I don't work for insurance companies anymore, um, is, that, is that you have to put it back. Uh, most policies are new for old. So when I first started in the insurance industry, we had lots of indemnity policies, and you know you just pay the person what the house was worth based on its age and depreciation, and then they brought in this wonderful replacement thing, and it's, it is old house, new house. And I've had this explain it to building survey recently where we had looking at a big building, earthquake damage, funny enough, and he was wanting to look at the building like, oh, I wanted to see whether it was needed maintenance and it needed all these other things that needed, as you would expect a building that's been around for 15, 20 years might need. And I'm saying, oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's the policy says new for old. Doesn't matter what the building was like prior, it, the policy will pay for a new building or the equivalent of whatever it was that you were repairing up to new standard. So if the standard, if the council won't let you um, issue, won't give you consent for a direct fix system, I hope they won't, then there's no, that's it, end of, end of story. It's, it goes on the cavity and the insurers pay for it. And they need to understand that. And one of the things I understand from my history is that Insurers are insurance people, they aren't building people. They rely on advice from other people and they have, some of them will be getting better and they, they have a reasonable amount of skill sets, but they often rely on advice. So the advice they get, they'll tend to look at and there might be a builder says, oh no, we can just put this back on a direct fixed system. And you need good advice that says, hang on, no, no, you can't do that. Uh, what's not gonna, a, it's not gonna comply with the building code. 
back to what we talked about before. And actually, you won't get a consent for it. And you start saying to them, well, are you going to guarantee this work? You think, you know, you, you, your house is on the line for the next 10 years. Are you going to stand behind it and go, oh, no, probably we won't. And then you go, well, the answer is, and you start looking at it like that and actually make them start understanding that it's important they do it properly. And it's really important they do it properly. And it Uh, 117 is that one? Um, yeah, so so you, when you do, so it can't be, any, so it can't be any worse than, yes, yeah, so it can't be any worse than what it was. It's probably what they're saying. Is it under the? Is it one one two one seven? It was. Um, yes, they, uh, yeah, they're really good discussions to have, and and um, I had one recently with the council officer yesterday. And it's really just trying to work it out. And it's only you just have to kick it around and work it out. But I'd be, um, yeah, it's, it's still about performance. And so I'd put it back to the contract. You can see, you know, how's this ever going to work? And if it was a fibre cement system, and you'd say, well, we know that that system doesn't work because it's through the courts at present, or whatever it might be. And we know this is why it won't work. Da 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 da. And how are you going to make it work and how are you going to stand by it? And someone's got to design that system. So as a designer, can you design it and, s and know it's going to work? Um, it doesn't, and maybe it doesn't meet the, the risk matrix anymore. And so actually you've got to really put it on a cavity. And it's not that much bigger deal to put it on a cavity anyway. So it's, it's you know, and even in cost, it's not huge amounts comparatively. So it's, um, I don't know why they'd really argue about it unless they've had bad advice probably along the way. And it's probably bad advice what they're working on. And so it, it does, it, it, I'm surprised they take that attitude, and I know some, some will, but my experience of insurers is that despite the perception that they try and avoid their claims and minimise their, their losses, they still want to get the claim settled in a way that works for everybody, generally. They want to get it through. They, they don't want stuff that hangs around that's problematic. They want to just make it work for everyone as a rule. But you only need one person to come up with some alternative without the bigger holistic picture it does confuse it slightly. I've, I've got an example currently in Wellington where I've got a multi-storey building about 11 or 12 storeys and it's got a mm -hmm. glass reinforced um, cement cladding system, GRC system, uh, which are actually lightweight concrete, not very thick, with bolted to a steel frame. So of course the earthquake comes along, the steel frame is designed to move wonderfully, which it did, and but the, <coughs> the, the cladding system itself didn't work that well because they were doing di different things and it's got quite a lot of cracks and, and right through the cladding system and when we put cameras and looked you can see all the junctions are bent and there's cracks and there's the connections are broken behind and the, the original concept from the designing engineer was oh you can just repair it and you can just grind the cracks and just fiberglass them and just that'll be all good. I'm looking going how's that, how's that going to work and how's that going to work long term? Is, was it going to meet building code? Who's going to stand behind it? Who's going to guarantee it? And you know that it won't work. And anyone that understands actually how these things really work knows that you can't possibly repair it and expect it to be code compliant and, and do, the do the what it's supposed to do for the next 15 years or whatever it might be <coughs> or for the remainder. And so the recommendation is going to be that this whole building has to be, I suspect, be recleared based on the evidence that actually you can't realistically expect. And even to the degree that you can't expect a tradesman to actually hanging off the scaffolding or, or, or ropes or whatever it might be to go over a big building and actually do the work that's required to bond this thing to make it actually properly repaired. Because when you know if you work with fibreglass or it's, it's, it's 
the peers, because they talk to the external, but you, you can't get behind, you can't get into lots of other, and you can't, you can't do the bits behind that hold the, the cladding to the, the framing. And, and this is the, the suggestion that was going to be was suggested to the insurers, so they think that's the solution. So our problem is you have to educate them and bring them up to, gee, guys, this ain't going to work. And then you have to talk to the people that design it, say, are you going to fix it? Are you going to guarantee it? At which point I suspect they'll start going backwards. So they are the, the sort of issues, to, and it's about doing it properly. Just going back to what we talked about, do it properly. Make sure these things are done properly and not Mickey Mouse and we do so much Mickey Mouse stuff. What do you say? Um, whether, uh, bevel back, where the board works particularly well. Um, you know that first building, that very first slide I showed you, that was a um, rusticated with the board. And that, that there's some essential differences in the rusticated one that sits flat to the framing, the bevel back is, is kicked out and so the water sort of works and works way better, providing the other detail around it works. And again, I talked about the treatment levels, 3.1, 3.2. So if you've only got 3.1 and it starts rotting, that's not achieving the right, what the, the best outcomes. The other one that's really good cladding and you'll be really familiar in Christchurch is um, the brick veneer. And that, from a weather tightness perspective, that works fantastic. And I've investigated somewhere. I've actually, even where all the, 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 the um, back of the cladding's filled up with debris and, and the weep holes have been blocked up, and it was only Douglas fir framing, not a problem with the framing at all. It was so well separated that we know that, in fact, they're designed to let water down the back through the down the brick and they drain and dry, and that works really well. Um, and the example of the weatherboard is uh, a number of years I had to go and do some work for the Wanganui District Council, again, about co compliance. An architect, so you have to be. An architect had designed his own home and he'd made his own weatherboards and he'd made them out of plywood. So he cut plywood strips about this deep and they were going to be the weatherboards which he put a little bot put on the back and he tipped them all so they would act like a bevel back weatherboard. The Wanganui District Council said, or City Council said, we don't have any confidence in that system. And the building was also had a lot of um, flat sheet plywood. They were absolutely happy with the plywood sheets, no problem at all. They felt confident with that. But when I went and investigated, guess which one was working best? Mm. It was a weatherboard one, was working way better. The plywood sheets had badly checked and cracked. And one of the reasons is that with the plywood, the water starts at the top of the wall and works its way all the way down the wall from top to bottom and it doesn't get shed. It just absorbs into the plywood. The sun comes up and beats on it. It splits and it, it, as the checks open up, the water gets in, it works, work, gets worse and worse. And whilst it wasn't rotting, it was certainly deteriorating quite and split quite badly where the weatherboard ones, actually, they were really good because the water had basically just kept dripping off and drying off. So, so the important thing there is about you know, the 4Ds, the construction 4Ds. Drainage, drying and deflection gives you durability. And if you can remember those, because that's really important to how, as a design philosophy to, to your designs, so if you've got drainage, drying and deflection of water, that you'll automatically get durability of the product and everything you need to. But, and it's the, so I think of the plywood with the, with the water draining down the front face of the plywood, not being able to drain or dry or to, it doesn't get deflected, it just sits there and just that <coughs> bit, the, the bit of water that hits the top go, has to go all the way to the bottom. And, it's all, and it makes a huge difference to everything we do, so, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm not keen on fibre cement systems because they don't drain dry, deflect very well. And in fact, the opposite happens. They tend to absorb moisture. <coughs> um, one of the systems I was looking at it yesterday still allowed moisture in behind the cavity. It allowed moisture into the top of the sheets and down the back of the sheets, unsealed sheets. And again, and the sheets are glued on and you go, how's this ever going to work? Any, any other thoughts? Yeah, uh, well, that doesn't deflect the water. Like I've, my house got vertical board and batten, and same sort of thing. But it doesn't. It's good, but it doesn't deflect the water, the water the same way as a, um, a weatherboard will, or bevel back weatherboard. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah, because you've got better durable, and 
it's better resist, it's better keeping water off, off the surface, especially if it's oil or painted, then it doesn't absorb moisture the same. Yeah. I hope they're not at all. Yeah. Um, but, um, you just have to build more brick or um, stone buildings down this way. <laughs> so, all good? And maybe... get there eventually. <laughs> okay, I think we're due to break soon for um, morning tea, but I'll start off. So this is um, my perspective of timber remediation. So um, how many people here have done any timber remediation work? Anyone? Okay, a couple? Yep, okay. Um, it's not to be entered too lightly, <laughs> um, but hopefully after today you'll be feel a bit more confident in it. So um, generally the work that I do, 90% um, of my work is timber remediation um, or reclads, um, and that can be um, Mediterranean style homes, um, the typical new homes built with untreated kiln, timber, um, plaster direct fixed polystyrene, fibre cement claddings, very, very common. Um, but one of the major things is the lack of the regular maintenance of the houses. So um, people seem to think they don't need to maintain their houses anymore. And um, what they don't realise is a lot of the claddings that you put on the buildings, if you don't maintain it the way that the manufacturer requests you to do it, if anything goes wrong, it voids your warranty. So that's something we really need to drum into the clients is that they must keep maintaining their home. Um, I've got friends who have got um, polystyrene houses in Wellington on a hill, um, but they, after every storm, they wash it down. Um, they, they check it regularly every year. And it's, and it's like the day it was built, and it, it's not a problem. But then you get someone else who's got exactly the same construction, who haven't checked it, haven't looked after it, and, and that just causes problems. Oh, and also a lack of construction details. <laughs> um, most of the houses I deal with when I get the archive plans, there are like four sheets of drawings, if I'm lucky, or three sets of drawings. And this is back in the 2000s. We didn't have to do a lot of drawings. We didn't have to do a lot of detailing. And a lot of it was left up to the builders, which of course we just don't want anymore. So this is one of my typical um, houses. Um, this was a direct fixed uh, fibre cement with a plaster system over the top. And it had lots of junctions and everything. You can see we've got, um, if you look up here, we've got two barge flashings coming into a point. Um, there's actually a step up the top here at the apex. And um, we've also got a window, we've got a membrane deck, we've got a roof coming down here that's only that far off the membrane deck. Um, even the membrane uh, gutter deck's got a step in it. <laughs> so it was, just a, it was just a nightmare. And it had been leaking pretty much since the day it was built. Um, this is another one. You can see really complex roof. Um, really, it, it doesn't have to be that complex. It's not even a nice looking building. Um, but just, you know, how do, we, how do we deal with intersections like that where you've got two roofs coming in and they're connecting um, and not at a really good point to connect either. 
so it's just having to deal with stuff like that. So yeah, that was built in 1999, and it's I've been working, I've been involved in that house for about maybe three and a half years. It's been through three owners. Um, everyone, everyone thinks, oh yeah, I'll buy it and I'll do it up, but they don't realise the exact cost and how much it's going to be, and then they think, oh no, that's too big for me, so then they sell it on to someone else. Um, yeah, so we're still waiting to actually replead that one. Uh, now this one here, this is an architecturally designed extension from 2009 that is now going through the courts uh, because it's been leaking. Um, just really bad uh, junctions, um, like the gutters, the gutters were just terrible. Um, the, the outlet for the gutter was a plug. Um, and as you can see, they, when they laid the membrane, they did it in all little bits and it's all curled up and yeah, it's just um, not good workmanship at all. And these clients are now facing a $600,000 replay, unfortunately. So when I deal with a client, um, generally we're very open from the start. It can be really, really difficult. Um, they're very emotional. Um, I've kind of lost count of the number of clients I've had burst into tears. Um, but once they sort of get over that shock, and um, we explain why we have to do it. I mean, this is their biggest asset, and they've put all their money into their houses. And we're, and we're dealing with houses that, you know, they might have paid 400000 for, and they're looking at a $300,000 um, replab. That's how expensive it can be. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're in a million-dollar area, that's not so bad. You'll probably get that money back. But in a lot of areas, you, you probably wouldn't get it. So um, we, we have four options that we offer our clients. <laughs> um, the one, first one is do nothing, um, in which case we uh, help them sell their house as is. Um, so we've, we will give a report, we'll say exactly what's wrong with the building. Um, we have a couple of real estate agents that we deal with who are used to selling leaky homes. So everything's all above board, and um, it's actually amazing how much a leaky home will sell for. Um, yeah, you won't get, you know, it might be 200 or 300 less than what you would get, um, but people are still willing to buy them. Unfortunately, some people who buy them don't understand <laughs> what they've actually bought, but, um, you know, they soon, they soon realise. Uh, the next one is temporary repairs, which generally we as um, designers won't get involved in. That's more builder-led. And we make it very, very clear to the client that it is only temporary, um, that your building will continue to deteriorate, and at some stage you will have to do some remediation. But it may be that they're having trouble getting finance or something like that. So um, that's not one to be recommended, though. Uh, generally, we wouldn't, we'd, rather than do temporary repairs, we would actually say sell and move on. Uh, the next one is a partial replad. Now, that's if only one, uh, like a small area of the house is affected. Like in Wellington, we have a lot of south faces um, that get really hammered with our southerlies, and um, so quite often it might just be one face of the building, one elevation. So what we do there is we design a plan and um, we w yeah, and we'll just put in a consent for one elevation. But what happens with that is it, it does send off a, a bit of a red light to council that there is an issue. So generally when we do only one elevation, we do check just around the sides to make sure that um, we're not going to, um, you know, we are going to actually fix the problem and that sort of thing. And then the best option is a full replab. Now, this is the best option for your clients because it's all, um, it's all consented. We have a building surveyor um, check it all off. We have the, Q the QA. They get full warranties because it's all new um, cladding, it's all new roofing, 
um, membranes, that sort of thing. So um, it's a lot better protection for the client if they do a full reclad. And, um, but of course it's the cost. <laughs> yeah. Um, Um, that, that's pretty extreme. There, there have been some cases where we've done, um, the, the, the clients decided to do a full rebuild. It can be a bit tricky. If you've got a concrete slab, generally you, ca you can't rebuild on that concrete slab unless you get it fully investigated. Council won't accept the fact that it's existing and um, they want it proven that it'll take the new structure and things like that. So when, if it was a, Probably if it was a um, timber subfloor, then yeah, that would be an option. But a lot of the houses now have the concrete slabs and it's actually quite difficult. You, you have to take that whole concrete slab away and you can find an engineer who will actually sign it off. Yeah. So generally it hasn't been an option for us. Yeah. But I know there have been cases in Wellington, especially where um, yeah, that they've just said, no, bowl it and we'll start again. Yeah. Yeah, but it is, yeah, if you're keeping that foundation, it's a little bit tricky. Yep. <coughs> um, you've got 10 years to make a claim. Um, a lot of, lot of the buildings we see are outside that 10 years. They might be 12, 14, uh, 19. Um, the, the one that I said has gone to court, that, that was within the 10 years, and that's the only reason that it's gone to court. Um, so most, most of ours, um, they, they don't have anywhere to go. They've got no one to come back against because the builder's warranty is only for 10 years. Um, a lot of the materials are only for, um, they'll give you, you might get a 15-year warranty on your cladding, but once again, if you haven't maintained it, they'll just walk away. So it's, um, you're pretty much stuffed, really, unless you get it within that 10 years. Yep. Um, only if you catch it within the 10 years, yeah. Yep. Um, the master builder's warranty is pretty much to protect the master builder. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, really... You, yeah, it's, it's really difficult to actually um, to claim on it. Yeah, so you're generally just going to have to foot, foot the bill, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, some need to see a signed thing. I, um, I know some of the plaster systems, you, um, you have to get people to actually come out and inspect it. Um, things like that, um, but yeah, you're meant to keep a, a schedule of when you've washed the house down and, and everything else, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mo most renovations were, would end up having to do some timber remediation, um, just for the fact um, of the age of the buildings that you're renovating, um, chances are it's got borer damage um, or, it's, or it's failed in some place. Yeah, but it's just about educating um, people now that they have to wash their houses down. They ha they have to check them for leaks. They have to clear the gutters, um, and it, and I don't think it should be regulated. I think it's a, it's just a um, just making people aware that they have to do that. Um, otherwise, it's going to add too much cost. Right. Yeah, so yeah. 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 Yeah, you'll see a couple. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think, um, like, when, when I was training, um, I trained at Unitech, and one of the comments my lecturer said to me was, oh, Kim, your houses are going to be really expensive to build. And I said, why? And he says, well, you've got, you know, your joists are all at 400 centres and you're using this size timber and everything. And I said, well, I don't want it to fall down. You know, I want it to be a solid house. And he said, oh, but it's going to cost too much. So they, they were teaching us at school only to design to the minimum, which is ridiculous. And that's half our problem, I think. Yeah. So um, 
the thing with the client is um, be realistic about the cost and the time. Um, it's not cheap. Um, there's a lot of people involved. Um, there's a lot of health and safety things involved as well, uh, especially if you're dealing with a really bad leaker with the stachybotrys. Um, you've got scaffolding costs. Um, there's all sorts. Of, there's all other costs that you've got to think of. Um, they might have to move out of the house. Um, they might have to store their stuff um, places. So it all adds up. Um, most of our full reclads um, start at three hundred thousand up. So it's a big investment. And then um, generally we give the client time to adjust <laughs> and to go through their bank. <laughs> And, um, and hopefully um, they're in a position that they can actually um, go ahead and make the house, uh, change the house. So this is the sort of thing that I'm involved in. This is a 1898 villa on Tasman Street in Wellington. It's a very old area of Wellington. Um, it's, it's a very steep, sections like that. Um, it's a three-storey timber um, balloon frame house and we were bought in because the owner had decided he was going to get it repainted. Painters came in, um, oh we can't repaint that, the weatherboard's a shot. So we got called in to um, look at replacing and um, doing the consent to replace quite a few weatherboards and things or not even the consent at that stage and then we went into the basement area down here and that had been sort of filled in after the house was built. The piles and everything were pretty much on the ground and on the side wall, where you can see all the blue um, stuff, the, the bottom of the um, studs were that far from the ground. There was nothing holding it up except for the cladding. So we immediately uh, got the tenants out, <laughs> um, propped the building and um, then proceeded to, to get a repair plan in, in place. So um, this one here, we had to lift the house 1.2 metres high so we could get underneath and we've totally rebuilt the um, foundations. It's actually currently um, underway at the moment. So this was when, this was about three months ago when we actually lifted the house and I think last week we put it back down on its new foundations. Yep. So um, just to lift the house was um, $40,000 uh, and then the reclad is going to be about another two hundred and eighty, I think by the time we've done the foundations and reclad the walls and re-supported the structure that's attached to the outside. Uh, this one here is uh, built in 2000 um, by a property investor three three units on the site this was the front unit um, direct fixed uh, fiber cement um, leaked from top to bottom uh, we had to dig out uh, around the entire basement and re um, membrane the, the uh, basement walls uh, huge huge job because as you can see there's the neighbor's house right next door. Um, so really, really difficult to do, really expensive. Um, this client didn't want to do a full reclad. This started off as a partial reclad. Luckily, by the time we started ripping off one wall, he realised how bad the house was. It had also been built really badly. There were um, uh, fixings missing on the bottom plate and all sorts of stuff like that. So we pretty much um, built, rebuilt this pretty much from the ground up by the time we've finished. Um, so in terms of design, um, if you're doing reclad, look at the design of the building and if you can, take out all the risk. Um, that, that last one that I showed you, that roof had, I think I worked out, it had a risk score of 20 or over 20 and by the time we redid it, it had a risk score of about 12. So um, we really reduced that down. Yeah, so does it really need to be that complicated? And um, can you add eaves? Um, can you get rid of your internal gutter by just repitching the roof? Um, 
does it have to have three different types of cladding? Um, that's something that we find, especially where they join, that there can quite often be um, difficulties uh, if they haven't been flashed correctly. And another big leak problem is the upper level decks, especially, um, you know, you put a nice deck off your bedroom, but really how often do they use it? So um, if you can get rid of that or if you can enclose it and put a roof over it, that will definitely help. Yep. So, um, shall we stop the full stop for morning tea? Okay, so um, I'll continue on with my talk. Um, just a side note, this is what I do in Wellington. So um, I know it might be slightly different in Christchurch, but um, this is how I have to deal with what I do um, with Wellington City Council. Hutt City Council and um, that sort of thing. So, and the other thing I wanted to say was um, my company works alongside a building company, which makes my life a lot easier because I have complete control over my builders. Um, so I'm, I'm, I know that they're going to do what I design, <laughs> which isn't always the case um, for you guys probably. Um, so this one here, this is a, a, a deck on a. Uh, block of six townhouses and every single townhouse was designed the same but they were all stepped and we started off at number one and ended up going through to do unit four. Uh, unit five refused to do anything and unit six went ahead and also uh, did some recladding. Uh, units one to four were completely reclad. Uh, unit one which was on the end was the worst um, and their cladding was uh, direct fix rusticated weatherboard really complicated junctions um, like there's a lot you can see there's a lot going on at the corner of the deck there we've got a handrail coming in um, that's the party wall and the unit on this side it's the wall sort of on their side their party wall stops halfway up the wall of the back unit um, we've got a sloping uh, skylight uh, thing that was going on yeah, and um, as you can see, there's no cappings. There's only a timber capping on the top of that balustrade. Um, so that was a major issue. So what we did is we tried to take away some of the risk and we squared up um, a lot of the junctions. So we got rid of the sloping um, uh, skylight. Uh, we took the unit on this side, we took the uh, boundary wall up to meet the other one, so it was a lot easier to flash, and we weren't having to deal with um, too many uh, junctions. So that's what we did on that one. Um, this is the skylight. So it, it was a really weird, it came down on this really strange angle. And if you look, yeah, so here's the skylight here, terrible flashing, it was just a glass plane um, that had been sort of flashed and put up behind the cladding and then this is the roof that comes down and this is the internal gutter which was only like that wide and um, was taking the whole roof uh, load so um, that was a major uh, leak point so what we did is we took out the skylights and extended the roof at the same line and then just put in traditional skylights um, where we made fully welded um, aluminium flashing that ran from the ridge uh, right down to the gutter. And that gutter there is uh, stainless steel, fully welded on site, and um, it all meets the code, it's the right width and everything else. And um, yeah, so that's, uh, we, we definitely don't do any colour steel flashings if we can help. We always do powder coated aluminium and are powder coated both sides, or we do stainless steel. Durability? Um, durability. So um, that's all, uh, it depends on the size. Most of our gutters are only about five to six metres long at the most, and we allow for that at, at the ends that it can actually move slightly. Yeah. Yep. We haven't had any trouble with it, with them at the moment. Um, the other reason we used stainless steel was because that was three stories up and couldn't be accessed. 
without scaffolding. Um, so we see a, a lot of um, different types of structure. So um, in Wellington, we have a lot of balloon framing. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have had to deal with balloon framing, but that's when uh, your studs go from the bottom plate all the way up to the roof. Um, that was in the time where we had big trees and they could all be in one part. Of course, we don't do that anymore. Um, but if we're remediating and balloon framing it, it brings in lots of different problems like, well, your stud's meant to go from the floor to the ceiling. It has to be a continuous piece. So how do we deal with that? So we end up quite often having to um, turn it into a platform type thing. We'll put in top plates and um, boundary joists and then we have to connect the, the floors back in. In balloon framing, the joists actually join to the side of the studs. And so if your stud's gone, chances are that the um, floor joist is gone as well. And of course, we're meant to go till we've got solid timber. So that can cause all sorts of problems um, as to how much um, work's involved. We might have to rip up the floor and replace quite a few joists as well. Um, balloon framing also makes it hard to do bracing. Because <laughs> of course, um, the traditional bracing, you, you have your hold downs on your bottom plate. Um, and of course there is no bottom plate in that middle level. So that's um, an engineered design solution that, that you have to get done. And each case can be slightly different. Uh, so E2 say, just shows the minimum. Um, we never go the minimum. Uh, we always go uh, beyond that. Um, we always specify WAB, even in any wind zone. Um, it helps with your bracing and it's just that extra protection. Uh, we always add uh, more overhang to our flashings, the upstands and um, out, out the sides. And um, quite often, if we've got a tricky junction, we'll use under flashings as well. So it's as a secondary form of defence. So, um, yeah, with materials, uh, Please select homes that last more than 15 years. Um, it's amazing how many people go, oh, no, I, my house doesn't leak, it's, it's weatherboard. But um, unfortunately, the weatherboard that we get now is not as good quality as it used to be. Um, we had a case recently where we had a new, um, it was about 10 years old, I think, and it was on a cavity. Um, but the water had been getting in the cavity and the boards were rotting from the back. Um, so on the front it looked fine, but we, when you pressed it, it, yeah, so the front looked perfect, so that's great. But then when we started to press it, you, th you could feel that it had all gone all soft. And then by the time we inspected it, yeah, all the ba it was rotting from the back out, um, which also doesn't help. We always specify H3.2 framing to exterior walls. Um, doesn't cost that much more um, and it's good it gives you that extra durability if by any chance it does leak again and of course we've already talked about our fully welded powder coated flashings so this this here is a really major junction we've got an internal gutter coming out joining into a roof and then having to go down and when we stripped the build off um, we found the steel uh, post <laughs> coming up right here. So that's, a, that's the top of a steel post, the support of a portal that was built. And we haven't quite figured out why it's sticking out of the building. Um, but we, we weren't allowed to uh, remove it. So what we did was um, we just did a fully welded uh, um, stainless steel flashing. This once again is three stories up. It'll never be maintained. So at least we know it's going to last. The other thing you've got to be aware of um, with your flashings, if it does wear out and you've got to replace it, you can't replace it without removing cladding. So technically, although it may only have to, technically it might say it only has to last 15 years, but if it's, that's if it's accessible. And the way my company looks at it is if you have to remove cladding to get to it, that's not accessible. So we make sure that all of our flashings have a 50 year um, durability and we also um, try to improve the accessibility for maintenance in our designs as well. 
So here's another example. This is a kick out fashion, um, and this is fully welded, and this is for a membrane deck. So we've gone up on site. Um, quite often, we'll take core flute up with us and we'll actually build the model on site of what the flashing looks like. And um, we'll take it away, we'll give it to our um, flashings guys. They will um, put it up to get, they'll put it together, but they won't fully weld it, they'll just spot weld it. Then they'll come up on site and they'll make any adjustments that are needed. And then um, they'll go back, fully weld it, and then um, we go pick it up and install it. So that flashing there, okay, that was $500. So it might seem a lot, but in the long term, we know that's not going to fail. So we've saved ourselves thousands in that case. So in terms of documentation, um, make sure your plans and specifications match. <laughs> I've had cases um, where we've done builds that other designers have done and um, they've just put generic specifications in and um, it causes problems on site. Um, uh, detail. Um, I spend m probably the majority of my work day detailing. Um, don't just put in a standard detail if you know that it's not quite going to work. Um, ha if you've got a junction that isn't covered by a standard detail, you've really got to sit down and think how you're going to handle that flashing or ha handle that detail. Um, so, so long as you can um, follow the principles, it's fine, it, it'll get through. So, um, and the other thing that we do in Wellington, which I'm not, I've heard that you don't have to <laughs> really do down here, is the quality assurance plan. Um, that's a really big issue at Wellington City. Uh, I'll cover that later on. So here's an example of one of my drawings where we've got different flashings coming in. And um, so what we'll do is we'll have where, where they all meet in the corner, that's where we would do a special, that's a really weak point, so we would do a special fully welded um, flashing at that point and then join the other flashings into it. And here's that flashing that we've done and then that's the membrane over the top. Now, <coughs> that membrane there is um, an equus membrane. Um, we've had some debate in the office recently as to whether we should be using a paint-on membrane. Um, the reason we like using a paint-on membrane is it has to be inspected every five years and recoated. So you know that it's going to be looked after. Whereas um, in places that are really hard to get to, if we, if we put a sheet product in um, and we tell the body corporate that's got a 20-year warranty, then they're not going to tick on it. They're not going to look at it. So um, I'm having debates with Wellington City Council at the moment <laughs> on the use of the Equus membrane. Um, that they're saying we shouldn't be using it, but uh, from our point of view, um, we like to use it. It's, it's a really good membrane. It's a paint-on system, so you can get into those really tight junctions. Um, but you know, it's not for everyone. You might, you might actually just want to use a sheet one, which is fine, so long as you make sure that it's going to be inspected and looked after. So back to this one. This was, um, yeah, this, I think this might have been one of my first reclads. <laughs> so it was a bit challenging at the start. Um, but here's some of our solutions. So where, where we come down and have the two barges meeting, we designed a special um, flashing, under flashing, and it had diverters and everything. So we know that any water is not going to be um, sent under the roof or the cladding. And um, also on the apex um, where it had jutted in, we had, so we had a roof coming, we had a wall coming up. That was all fully, fully welded and it extended at least 300 down each face. So we know that, that that actual junction on the top of that wall is not going to fail like it had previously. Um, so quality assurance schedules, um, these are really, really good because they, um, they keep a track of what 
is actually happening on site and who's responsible for what. So generally we'll um, have the consent number, we'll put the job scope on it, um, we'll put a few site details on it, and then we'll put the contact details of everyone who's involved in the build. So that, and that includes your cladding suppliers and your membrane supplier and your installer. And then you have a scope of works table and generally we have one for each elevation or if you've got lots of, um, like if you've got a building that goes in and out, you might want to have more than one for, for that elevation. And this is what our one looks like. So we have um, uh, the elevation that it is and then we break it up, <coughs> we break the build up. So it's um, the pre-cladding, so um, Hayden might be on site and he'll mark up which timber is to be replaced um, and then we'll replace the timber, we'll check all the hold down boat, bolts and everything else and so we just work our way through that and we tick it off and sign it as we, as we go. So it's either the builder or, if, or actually it probably is the builder, I don't, can't remember actually signing any off um, but generally I do like to be on site as much as I can. Um, and then we go in through the building wraps. Yep. Um, yeah, generally I do put, Wellington City require it. I, Christchurch don't. So in, at Wellington City, we have to provide a quality assurance. Um, and we are in argument, I'm in arguments with them at the moment um, because they turned around to me yesterday and said, oh, who's your building surveyor? And I said, I don't need to tell you who my building surveyor is. Um, I don't have to do that until after the consent's been issued and before we're about to start. And, um, that, and they know that they can't ask for that, but every time they still ask for it. You know, they, they think that we're going to let them know. But if we do know, then yeah, I'll let them know. But it, quite often we, the client hasn't signed the agreement with the building surveyor, because that's the other thing we do. Um, the building surveyors, we have them direct, um, they are contracted by the client. They're not contract contracted by us, so they're totally independent. Um, we don't want the client thinking that we are encouraging them to do more work than what's necessary. So um, the building surveyor is working for the client, not for us. Yep. Can Um, yeah, the, the quality insurance is um, the builder's responsibility, it's whoever's on site actually doing the building and, and the installing. Um, we... Uh, if, if, if there was an, a, a problem right on after the building, yep. and you'd actually be in, been on site as a, as a senior or so you're Yeah, um, we, we have a company policy that we're always on site. Um, that, that's one of the things that we do um, because it protects us in the end because we're doing high risk work. So you feel unsure. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, I'm, I'll cover that later. I'll, I'll tell you now. Um, our company has a um, million dollars um, PR insurance, but we have an extra half a mil um, for wet buildings. Um, and it costs us over $20,000 a year to have that insurance. Um, but it's well worth it because we don't want them coming back to us and saying you're liable um, yeah so we have we have complete control and i'd recommend that to anyone who's doing a full reclad is you keep complete control or you're involved in that process from start to finish because you know you might have your drawings and everything but if the builder's not doing what you want have said them to do then you know that that could come back to bite you yeah yeah so um it's not for the faint-hearted um a full reclad <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so check your PI insurance, um, make sure that um, they will cover you and if they don't then take out the extra, for the, for, you can take it out just for that particular job if you have to. Yeah, yep. so once that's all finished, um, signed off, um, generally whoever's um, supplied, like um, the fibre cement supplier, we'll, we'll get them to come up and have a look. Um, the membrane supplier will get them to come up and have a look as well. They, they, so they're in it, they sign it, and so it's a, it's a really good um, thing for the client. Yep. yep. So that's um that's how we do all that. And when it, when working with your builder, 
um, like I said, you really need to be involved from start to finish. So the sooner you can meet with your project manager or builder before the build begins, sit down, go over the, go over your um, plans, what what your ideas behind the, the remediation is, um, ask them if there's any problems. Every builder's got their way of building things. So generally we sit down with the builder, I'll go through my details, I'll make sure they understand what's happening. Um, if they don't understand, I'll get, you know, say, well, what is it you don't understand? Can you, have you got a different way of doing it? It might be a bit easier. I mean, I'm not a builder. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we do a lot of work before we even get on site. Uh, we always make regular site visits. Um, we build it into our contracts that we'll do site observation. And if the client's not willing to pay for that, we won't do it. Um, we won't do the project. Um, and yeah, so ensure that they build to your details. But like I said, they might have an easy way of doing it. One of, one of the guys that I work with regularly, he's got over 35 years experience in the last 15 in leaky homes. And um, he's really good at making it even simpler than what I've designed because I, I have a tendency to overthink it. Um, but he's, he'll just, especially once we're up on site, he can say, well, why don't we do it this way? And it, but because he's dealing with me and I've still got control of it, then it's okay because I can agree. But if I don't agree, um, yeah, please stand up to your builders if you don't agree with what they're doing. Um, there are still quite a few builders out there who just go, oh, well, I'll just do it this way, you know, and um, you can't afford to let them do that. And uh, be available, really. Um, problems occur on a rebuild pretty much every two days. <laughs> so you fix one problem and then they start on another area and you, and you get another problem. So um, just make sure you're available and um, are, are within easy access. Yeah, so um, things to watch out on, on site, just um, check the existing structure is up to standard. Um, so bring any substandard framing up and structure up to code, structural supports. Um, deck balustrades are a big one. As soon as you tuck a, touch a deck, generally you have to bring the um, balustrade up to um, code. And your fire ratings and bracing also have to be up to code as well. Um, yeah, so costs. <laughs> okay. So costs are, a, are really tricky for a rebuild. Um, or, or reclear, because half the time we don't know the full extent of what we're doing. So what we'll do is the things that we we can give um, a lump a lump sum on, or we can give a price on, we will. Generally, that 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 might be the replacement joinery, um, or uh, pretty much just the replacement joinery, really. Um, the rest we kind of have to just have as provisional allowances. Um, for, for a tender. Um, we, we might have a look at the, the job and say we think there's going to be 25% of this wall that needs recladding. So we'll, we'll start off at that 25% mark and then anything else that comes in will have to be a variation. Um, but the client is always aware of that before we start. So what we'll do, and generally we, we're over generous, like we'll say look we think this is, this is going to be a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar reclad, and if they if, if they're thinking, oh, you know, we really can't afford that, or if they say, yeah, that's fine, then that's good. But at least they know. But it may turn out to be only a two fifty, or a three hundred. But at least they've got that expectation to start off with. There's nothing worse than going back to the client and saying, look, we told you it was going to be two hundred thousand. It's now going to be four hundred thousand. Yeah, they won't appreciate that. Yeah, it's generally a rates tender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, if, if we can get a, a fixed price for something, we will. But generally, no, the, we generally don't do a fixed fixed price contract on a, on a reclad. You just can't. You'll lose money. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, and take into um, consideration the client might want to stage the remediation so they can stay in the house. Um, hear them seriously uh, think about that. Um, it's a lot of disruption and it's not healthy either. There's a lot of stuff, generally a lot of our buildings are full of stachybotrys and um, they shouldn't be living in there. And there's a lot of dust and stuff like that. Um, 
and also you're paying twice for scaffolding and things like that. So um, just make your client aware of that. That can increase the cost dramatically. And also the non-building costs, so they'll have to take out insurance. Um, they might have to move out. They might have to store all their stuff. Um, it's also hard to put a finish time on a reclad. Um, so generally, it's a little, if they have moved out, it's quite difficult to give them an actual move back in date. Um, so, but I th we find that if they're aware of that before we start, it, it, everything goes a lot, a lot easier. And so protecting yourself, like I said, check your insurance. Um, if you're not covered, then don't get involved. Uh, work as a team. So en engage your building surveyor early. Um, check your builder has experience with timber remediation, particularly if they've been suggested by the client. Oh, you know, I want you to use my builder. Make sure they know what they're doing. Um, and also build a relationship with the building inspectors and council. Um, we have a really close relationship with Wellington City Council. Um, they generally have uh, certain inspectors that will do their, their reclad work and um, it's really important to um, get to know them really well and um, take notice of what they say, what they want and if your project will go quite smoothly. Uh, get your technical advice from your suppliers. Um, this is a big one. <laughs> Um, we had a case where uh, we had a fibre cement product. Um, the fibre cement had to be installed a certain way, then it had to be painted. We went to uh, a paint company. The, pa the paint company had a certain way that the board should have been uh, installed and it was different to what the manufacturer stated. So we had to decide which warranty we wanted. Um, and we went with the paint system because that's actually the protection on your building. Um, yeah, so it's, it's little things like that. you just, just got to be aware of stuff like that. And um, don't cut corners, uh, take your time. <laughs> um, quite often I'll, I'll spend um, maybe a day working out a detail. It's, um, it can be quite expensive and time consuming, but um, I've got to make sure that I get that right. Um, so yeah, ensure your services are valued. Um, Fee, fees from, from our company aren't, aren't cheap. They're not the most expensive in Wellington. Um, but it's amazing how much time is involved. Um, not, not just in the drawing and designing, but um, the researching and um, just the conversations that you have to have with the builders and the project manager and council and, and everything else. So um, make, make sure you charge for it. Um, in, the, in respects of the actual total cost of the build, it, it's not that much um, and you don't want to get it wrong. Uh, so yeah, keep really good records. Um, yeah, if the client and the builder aren't engaged, if they're not on the same page, just walk away. Um, just, it's not worth it. You'll end up in court, I can tell you. Because it's, um, and it's your LBP on the line. So you've got to make sure that you um, look after that. And um, yeah, weather tight. There's a couple of really good books that MB have put out, um, which you can just get off the MB website. And also Brands has remediation details. Um, they're okay. Um, but they're, once again, they're also quite generic. And you'll find that a lot of the detailing that are supplied by the manufacturers in that they're for really common um, junctions. And anything that's slightly difficult, they, they, they won't provide a um, detail and they'll leave it up to you. So you take on that liability. Yep. Yeah. So just um, keep those four Ds in your head. And uh, yeah. So um, this is a before and after. So. Um, we reclad it in a. We had to reclad it in a fibre fibre cement weatherboard um, because of the fire rating, because it was so close to the other houses. Um, but we uh, made it look a bit more like the other houses in the area, and just simplified the roof. Um, that roof was horrific, and the steel beams. We we properly flashed though. They'd never been flashed correctly. They just went straight into the building. 
Um, so they, they were all um, sanded back, recoated, and recleared, all flashed correctly, and um, hopefully, uh, yeah, that'll last forever. And you can see, see the next one. We, we haven't got this job yet, but that's the next, the next unit, and it's actually um, in possibly worse shape <laughs> than the front one, but um, he's still recovering from doing the front one. So I'd say it'll be about a year or so before we get to do any more for him. Yeah. So any questions? Yeah. Are there any good guides for doing the bum toes, or is he so comfortable with that and he's okay? Not really. No. No. So just for, to go beyond it, you just um, it's really just increasing your, your distances of your upstands and um, the materials that you use and that that sort of thing. Um, yeah, there's there's no real guide. It's it's up to you really. Yeah. Um, it, so long as you're over the over the minimum, gen it, I've never been questioned on anything. If it's so long as it's over, yeah, yeah. That's the Yeah, yeah. And the other one is the ground clearance yep. around the building. Any comments in terms of your organisation and how you deal with those issues? Um, generally, uh, with the ground issue, um, we will put in a concrete nib, so we'll we'll cut the um, wall up 250, support it. Um, so as soon as you leave, they can go to green channel. Yeah, 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 because the ground tra channel is, is op opening yourself up for. Um, the, the client or the homeowner not maintaining it and it blocking up and then the same thing happening. Um, yeah, yeah, and you have to have um, an outlet every 3.6 metres or something. I don't know if it's the same down here. Yeah, you have to have all these different outlets and sumps and yeah. Yeah, I know, that's right. Yeah. The problem I sort of struggle with is if you cut an outcoat right around the building, which is what you sometimes have to do, Yeah. it means you're cutting every single Yeah, that's right. Internally as well. Um, yes. Yep. 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 But that's um, uh, we we're, we're very um, uh, conscious of the fact we don't we don't want to have to revisit that building. So um, that that's how that, that's company policy for us to do that. And in terms of the decks, what we're, what if it's an upper level deck, what we'll do is we'll um, um, put a double plate. So it means we have to lift the lift the door. Yeah. Yep. So um hopefully you've got room enough to be able to lift yeah, it up. So the bait again is that they're not tripping over the steps. So it's another otherwise I've done it with a double plate that then they use for Yeah, you put a co uh, you put a pedestal thing on the deck. Yeah, we've done that quite a few times as well. It, it, that's up to the owner to decide whether they want to do that, but we definitely recommend that they do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Alex, that's me.